Simon Stanford. It's three o'clock. KZSU Stanford, this is Modern Education here on the air with another live taping right here from the studio inside KZSU underneath Memorial Auditorium here in the heart of the Stanford campus. We are back with another exciting live show being done right here in the studio with a couple of amazing guests that I think are going to have some awesome awesome and useful information for you today. Now, uh, we're here every week, Fridays from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute home. You can always text us or call the studio line at 855-723-9010. Or if you want to text us, you can get us on that same number, or you can hit us on the Twitter, at KZSU or at KZSU DJ, and we will be happy to uh, see your message and get back to you. We always love to hear from our audience, wherever you are, anywhere in the world we are streaming online stanford.kzsu kzsu.stanford.edu slash live and we are also on the fm airwaves at 90.1 on the dial so if you put your dial right there just never ever change it and you will be doing the right thing for yourself to get the fresh information you need the noise you need the talk you need and the music from all over the bay area and the world we bring all kinds of brand new music here on this station so I got my co-host with me on the air again, Emily Quiles. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Oh, my gosh. So good. It's great to see you. Good to see you, too. You're looking especially radiant today. Is there something <laughs> wonderful happening in your life? It's called the false the false placebo. Where, I don't know. You're kind of like acting like everything's okay. okay. We call that <laughs> life syndrome. Life, just make, there, it, right? make it look right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a popular uh, way to approach life here at Stanford. <laughs> be majestic like a duck above the water, but below your little... Yeah, I heard this little, before. Actually, literally, yes. Yeah. Yesterday, where the little feet are trying to like swim oh, above water, and your head's afloat. <laughs> yeah, we are all there from time to time. It's such a high pressure environment, so you know. Yes, but thank I, you, Ben. I admire you. you for actually admitting it because so many people just try to keep going and going and acting like they're all okay. And maybe we are okay, but it's still okay to let us know where you're at. So uh, a little tidbit for your modern education for today. Now, I want to bring our two guests. We've got two guests today. Isn't that awesome? I know. Okay, two guests on the lines here. We've got Karen and Brandon, who are here from the Stanford Financial Aid Office. And they're going to talk with us about financial aid and hopefully give you some new information that can help you be prepared in the upcoming FAFSA season, which is in full swing right now. So can I just start by having you both just give us like a quick outline of what you do in the financial aid office? I'm going to start with Karen. You're the director of financial aid, right? That's right. I'm the director of financial aid. I've been at Stanford in that role for about 15 years now, so it's been, I've seen a lot of things coming up. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's exciting. I could imagine, at 15 Absolutely. years. Absolutely. Uh, and as director of financial aid, you know, really my job is to make sure we have the resources we need to run the program the way we want to run the program. So where do the resources come from? Well, for Stanford, mm-hmm. a lot of the money comes from our endowment. And that's because this is a private college, That's right. right. That's and is, right. Does that contrast with a public college? A lot of public institutions, they're relying on, you know, state or federal funding. Okay. We use some of those resources, too, but we also have this pool of institutional funds that we're right. very lucky to have. Yeah, Stanford has a huge endowment. I, last time I checked, I think it was something like $24 billion. Yeah, somewhere wow. in that neighborhood, yeah. I got, I'm got. i going to write a check for that and double it. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. I wish. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and a little over a billion dollars mm-hmm. of the bigger pot belongs to financial aid. So we're the only ones who can spend the proceeds from that money. That must be mm. kind of nice, it's right? It's pretty cool. So when you say the proceeds, you're talking about the interest earned yeah, off exactly. of that so it's, slice you know, of the we, pie. We pay out only a fixed portion Mm -hmm. of that every year because the whole idea of an endowment is that money will be there forever. 
Right. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily understand because Mm -hmm. wealth is, uh, I think, for a lot of people thought of as, you know, how much capital you have to spend right now. And I think an endowment is sort of looking at wealth as how much interest you can live off of without ever touching your principal. Is that right. is that accurate? That's right. One of my favorite stories about our endowed scholarships, yeah. if I may, uh, is that one of our first scholarship funds was actually established by Jane Stanford. Okay. When Leland died, Leland Jr., he had about a thousand dollars, eleven hundred dollars in a savings account. Um, which at the time was a heck of a lot of money. Right. And she didn't know what to do with it. So she established a scholarship fund for future students at Stanford. We still spend the proceeds from that fund today. That is so wow. beautiful. Isn't I see awesome? it melted in my heart right? a little bit there. <laughs> it feels so nice part of the Her Stanford. dead son's you know, life right. savings. Yeah, that's right. And created. A, Oh, that's so beautiful. Right. Nice. And it, for those of you who don't know, Leland Stanford Jr. was the son of the Stanfords, and he died while he was away at school, I believe is the story. I think he was 15, somewhere in there. Something age. like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I believe he was on the East Coast, and back then you didn't have flight. You couldn't just mm-hmm. fly across the country, so it was a big deal to send your son or your kid at all anywhere because you knew you may never see them again or it would be a very long time. So this was a a big changing point for the Stanfords and they created the university as sort of, that was the impetus to make this university happen, right? That's right. He was their only child. Wow. Mm. Wow. Okay, Brandon. Oh, yes. I don't know. Did we get like your your introduction finished? I don't want to cut you yeah, off. Yeah, close enough. Okay. <laughs> Brandon, tell us what you do at, at the yes. financial aid office. Yes. So at the financial aid office, I'm the loan coordinator. Uh, what I'm responsible for is making sure all of the loans disperse. So That's when the not money, a responsibility. money that is that is it. Are that you the one they thank when role. it happens? Or are you the one they can yes. thank to when it <laughs> both? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm get I get thanked when it happens and I get yelled at, you know, when it doesn't. Which sounds like the most you hear from? Is it more complaints or happiness? No, no, no. It's, it's more happiness because okay. I get a good job. <laughs> I hope more happiness comes yes, your way as yes, alone. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So, <laughs> but no, but that that really is my, my main job. Uh-huh. You know. So tell me, I, I want to understand this a little bit as far as how do you, what does it actually entail to make sure the money goes out? Is this just like clicking send on a spreadsheet or mm-hmm. is there, I mean, I just have no concept. Sure, sure. So when a student accepts the loan, mm-hmm. um, the loan becomes, well, I have to originate the loan. So that means I have to send it out to basically the Department of Education. The Department of Education does what they do, you know, whatever they need to do with mm-hmm. it send it back to us. Once it's sent back to us, it's like, okay, it's a good, it's a go. You know, they can get the money. So from that point, we have to check and see if they have their interest counseling, um, if they have their master promissory note. Once they have all the information that we need, that's when the loan gets dispersed to the students. And a lot of times the students, you know, they do not have their promissory note or they may not have their entrance counseling and they call in and say, hey, where's my money? You know, I did not get my money. You know, right. you need to give me my money. <laughs> well, all you have to do is sign this paperwork and you'll have this. Right, right. Okay, so what? Okay, so I'm, I'm just thinking about loans versus financial aid as like mm. grants or other things what's the difference and how does that actually play out on the yeah. ground either of you can or both can jump in any way you want so financial aid the term financial aid covers the whole umbrella mm-hmm. so both you know the grant and scholarship money the good money that you don't have to pay back right as well as loans eligibility for jobs you know things like that are all considered financial aid Okay, and, and so you deal with both then, That's grants, right. scholarships. And, and even work-study eligibility. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And then let, let, maybe how does the FAFSA play into all yeah. of this? Mm. What does that even <laughs> mean? How is it yeah, connected? Yeah, we love it, and you're pronouncing That's it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> There's some disagreement around the country in how that but, What's that. the other pronunciation? <laughs> the what's FAFSA? the wrong one? FAFSA? Is FAFSA? FAFSA, FAFSA, FAFSA. It's free application for student aid. That's right. right? You've got it. It stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. So uh, it's free. We like to remind people of that fact. It's it's quite a document, though. I remember filling it out. It's like, (laughs) I I hate myself by the time I'm done with it, but I'm hoping that it will make me love myself once I'm finished. It's got investment. Has it been since you filled it out? It's been quite a few years. Has it gotten better? It has gotten better. Okay, tell us about it. 
what is the actual this, process? This application form is actually owned by the U.S. Department of Education. It's, so it's, it's not a credit bureau exactly. that you're applying no, to? No, it's an application okay. to the U.S. government mm-hmm. okay. for the federal student aid programs that they have available. So that includes things like... Pell Grants, student loans. Okay. Okay. I got quite a few of those Pell Grants. Those exactly. We remember great. those. Those are, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> cool things. That's federal money. We yep. like that. Uh-huh. Um, so the FAFSA allows you to apply for all of those programs in one shot. Like one stop okay. shop. Yeah. Okay. And in, at, at any institution in the U.S. So, right. all, you know, all accredited colleges, institutions of higher ed in the U.S. use the FAFSA. So that's why there's lots of conversation about the FAFSA. So even... Private colleges are right. sort of bound to this as their their process for looking at federal funding or any kind exactly. of funding. Okay. Anybody who's going to award federal funding right. has to use this form. And if I apply, like for example, I'm applying for a public university, does mm-hmm. that FAFSA application change at all compared to like like you're saying with a Stanford process? Right. right. No, it's it? the same form, same okay. information. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're all evaluating eligibility for federal student aid on the same set of rules, whether mm-hmm. it's a public institution or a private institution. And do you have any idea how long it's been in place that there's been this sort of one central system? I, yeah. I don't want really on exact yeah. dates or anything. No, I, I mean, no. yeah, okay, that's fine. I've been fine. around yeah. for a long time. <laughs> it's been there at least 15 years, right? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to ask you about that, too, exactly. since you've been the here. 80s, okay. The FAFSA itself okay. has yeah, been yeah. in place. Okay. Yeah. So since, yeah, you're 15 years here, yeah. how much has that kind of the institution or the, um, the layout for FAFSA yeah. changed? Well, you know, the FAFSA <laughs> moved online at one mm. point. Yeah. Right? It used to be a paper form. It I moved. bet that was a nightmare. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I saw, I saw the online we just form, don't want right? to talk about that, yeah, anymore, yeah. right? It moved online, and I have to admit, for the first several years that it was online, it was just a paper form moved online, sure, right? Yeah, which yeah. isn't necessarily a good idea. <laughs> and uh, now it is much more of a you know responsive design. If you answer one question mm. in a certain way, you may not be asked this series of questions right. that don't apply to you, right? So they've been putting together this army of computer programmers. Exactly. Who've been so exactly. It, yeah, so it's gotten awesome. better. So, okay, let's, let's get back to the types of money you can get, right? There's grants and scholarships, which aren't paid back. And then I think loans are probably the ones that people want the most information about because mm-hmm. that's money they're mm-hmm. on the hook for and they, they have to pay they, back. Right. Yeah. So what kind of loans could people get? Like what is kind of the basics of just what they should understand if they're applying for a loan? Sure. So the type of loans, they can get a subsidized loan. They can get a unsubsidized loan. Can we, can we break those sure, down? Sure. Quick? So I always explain it this way. You know, the, the best way to understand a sub and unsub loan is with the subsidized loan, while you are in school, no interest accrues. With the unsubsidized loan, interest accrues. That's the best way. I mean, it's a lot more to it, but sure. you know, one reason, fact, that you can go by is subsidized loan, no interest, unsub, interest. So if you're a student and you're thinking about applying for a loan, your primary goal would be a subsidized loan so that you're not paying interest until you have a hopefully, a presumably a job when you get out of college. Right. And unfortunately, right. it's not your choice whether you're going to get okay. the subsidized right. or the unsubsidized right. loan. So yeah. the FAFSA mm-hmm. gives us information about the student's financial situation. Okay. So if a student's financial situation is such that they can't afford to pay for college from mm-hmm. from the perspective of the FAFSA. So and this a, is taking into account their parents' earnings and their For earnings, undergraduates, yeah, exactly. For undergraduates, we're, we're including parents in that equation mm-hmm. okay. for the most part. For graduate students, it's just based on their personal situation. Mm-hmm. Based on that information and our costs, if there's a difference between what a family can be expected to f- pay, we call mm-hmm. that the expected family contribution from the FAFSA, right? right? The (laughs) EFC, right? Depending on what that EFC is and what the total costs are, if there's some what we call need, a difference between those two things, then you're eligible for the subsidized loan. So that's basically coming up with some formula that decides, okay, your parents make this much, you have this much in savings or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, and you got it. Okay. And then we can say, well, you, you have a, a deficit, we're going to subsidize it. And, it. and then if your parents or you have enough money, 
then it would say there is no deficit. And so if you want loans, that's going to be unsubsidized. That's, uh, that's, correct. that's correct. And the, the only thing I would change about that is it's it's the formula says your parents don't have the money, right? right? right. It, people's definition of what they can and can't pay mm -hmm. often differs. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, yeah. Now, what about if someone who was, uh, say, went through, um, like, um, what is the word? I'm, I'm, I'm totally blanking. A kid that was yeah. like a foster child or someone sure, who was emancipated, sure. do they so, have yeah, an independent the, scoring? Exactly. Or? Through the FAFSA, they would be considered independent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for undergraduates, so graduate students are always considered independent right, if you're in a right. graduate program. But undergraduates, if you're uh, under 24 years old, if both of your parents are still alive, right. if you weren't um, a ward of the court or somehow involved in the legal system when you were a child, right. um, or if you're not a veteran of the armed services, or you don't have kids of your own, then you're considered dependent, right? And what if one of your parents is gone and you don't, like they were never part of your life, but they're still, you know, legally your parent and they're making good money? Is there a way to around that? I'm, I'm just thinking there's people out there that sure. might be in that exact So this situation. is where this gets really complicated. Yeah. So for federal aid, the federal, the FAFSA application mm -hmm. only wants to know if your parents are divorced or separated. They only want to know about that parent that you live with. So primary parent only. That's right. Okay. If that parent has remarried, they want to know about the, the new spouse. Okay. Right. All right. So if Fair. you have a, a, a parent that's missing and right. they live primarily with one parent, right. they, they're they not going to count right. the income for the missing parent. So now what gets really complicated that we haven't talked about yet, we talked about Stanford's endowment and all this money we have to give mm -hmm. out in scholarship mm -hmm. funds. So we don't use the FAFSA to base our decisions about scholarship eligibility. We use another form, a second form, called the profile. I don't like <laughs> the sound of it. What's the profile? <laughs> it's <scary>. ominous. Yeah. <laughs> so the profile is actually very similar to the FAFSA, mm -hmm. but it asks more detailed questions about the family's financial circumstances. So the profile, one of the things that it does that the FAFSA doesn't, if there are two natural parents who are still alive, we do have an avenue to ask for information from that non-custodial parent. Okay. Right? Because we want to make sure we're looking at all of the resources available to the student before we spend our institutional funds. Mm -hmm. right. Now, Stanford has some uh, different ways of looking at even tuition, right? Because they're a private college. Is it true that the tuition can change depending on how much your, your parents earn? That's an interesting way to phrase that, phrase that question. Um, Everybody gets charged the same amount of tuition for, you know, to be a full-time undergrad. Okay. What changes? So in the olden days, when I first came to Stanford a long time ago, we used to say, we've got a really great financial aid program. Those of you from low-income backgrounds, just apply. We'll tell you how much you qualify for. I know we cost a lot of money. Uh, trust us, it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And then we wondered why low-income students were afraid to apply to institutions like ours. And right? what did you, is there an answer? And so what we did to help that, and I'm, you know, we're not perfect. We, I don't think we've solved all I've of our problems. This is perfect. an issue, yeah. right? <laughs> My co-host gets pretty close as a co-host. <laughs> <laughs> There's Thank some perfection. <laughs> What we did several years ago now is said, look, if your family makes, and now it's $65,000 a year or less, mm -hmm. we're not going to expect parents to pay mm. Okay. for our institutional scholarship funds. So yeah. that's a simple statement that the, even that student here's, here's in the, the ninth grade, point, yeah, okay. they understand no matter where you live in the country, how big your family, mem family is, how many kids are going to be in college, all those complicated things that feed into the formula we just cut through that and said here's a simple message so right. if one parent if you, either parent makes less than 65 both together the household income the household income okay, okay. right and what what happens above that so we said it's also important that we reach out to middle income families because let's face it stanford costs a lot of money right mm -hmm. what is the cost uh, if we can throw it out yeah, there next year well year? next year the <laughs> total cost of attendance for an academic year that includes you know things like books and personal mm -hmm. expenses and sure. travel and all of that 
about 75,000 for most students. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. It's a big yeah. number. Yeah. It's, <laughs> not, just to compare, I think a, a UC, in, in a college in the UC system might be something like 30, 35, 35 yeah. something like that. 40 these days. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. All right. So yep. that, that gives our listeners a good idea. Now, you, I sorry I cut you yeah. off there. Middle so, income. So we realized that those families at higher incomes needed a simple message too. Sure. And so what we came up with is, okay, if your family makes less than $125,000 a year, mm -hmm. we're going to make sure your tuition gets covered. Okay. So, so you'll get at least enough scholarship chunk. to cover your tuition, mm -hmm. right? Which means mom and dad might have to pay for room and board. Right. You know, we're talking fifteen to $20,000 in that range. Right. Okay. Right? Okay. okay. And then above 120,000. So if you think about those for two those few people, yeah, that, <laughs> for those many people. Yeah. So if you think about who yeah. still can't <laughs> afford 75,000, right? right? It's still right. a lot of money. I agree. So you think about those two data points: zero at 65, mm -hmm. probably about let's say 17,000 mm -hmm. at 125. You would expect parent contributions to just go on a straight line. Nobody can see me. I'm moving my hands. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go fine radio, but I'm. It doesn't it. work very yeah. well. The leg goes up the other nice goes down. Step in her hands. So amazing. you you think about those two data points, and uh -huh. it just continues up from there. Mm -hmm. It gets much more complicated as family incomes get higher. So there isn't this like they maybe There's they're assuming you have a lawyer looking at this yeah. document once you have that much money, <laughs> maybe, so it's okay to make it more complicated. Your accountant. Well, you know what? I figured they're the going to figure it out. So we got all the information from that <laughs> that we need. If you make over one hundred twenty thousand, your parents can afford to have a lawyer go through the paperwork, and we, we do we have still a feel calculator you, on our oh, website. Okay. <laughs> that families can use, you know, those prospective students yeah. can use to, to put in some basic information about their family situation. It's not as complicated as the right. FAFSA and the profile, just at bare bones, and they get an estimate of what their aid might look like. How, mu yeah. How much does, um, like, the number of people you have in your family take into consideration? Yeah, I keep mentioning that, don't I? It, it is important. So you, you think about it. A family that makes 125 mm -hmm. If they have got, they're a family of five, and they've got two kids in college, is yeah. in a very different financial situation than that family of three who's only looking at one kid in college, right? So all of those are very important factors in the analysis. Okay. Yeah, because I come from a family of well, four kids. Mm -hmm. And so there's right. all that planning of, okay, right. so how are we going to do this? As each kid goes off to college, right. it becomes more... Right. More packed. Um, so essentially what that formula does is calculate an amount we expect a parent to be able to contribute. Mm -hmm. And then it looks at how many of those family members are in college and it divides that number up among them. Okay. So for those families with multiple kids in those years when they've got two or three kids in college, they're going to qualify for more than in years when there's only one. Now, you, you've specified just a couple of times as we've been going through this for undergrads. That's right. So it sounds like the majority of the, the financial aid things you're dealing with are for undergrads. So Stanford's need-based financial aid program is for undergrads. Right. The graduate level, uh, all bets are off, right? And it's different in each department. Exactly. It's totally right? different. So mm -hmm. at the graduate level, assistance is merit-based. Mm -hmm. It's the academic departments and faculty who are mm -hmm. making decisions about who they want to offer fellowships and assistantships to. Right. Right? What we do in the financial aid office for graduate students is process those federal student loans. Mm -hmm. So those unfunded master's students who aren't being is that supported a lot of them by or the most department. Of them? It's not. It's a small percentage. It's mm, typically okay. about, you know, less than 20% of our wow. graduate population actually take out loans. And actually, at the undergraduate level, it's a small percentage as well. Yeah. Last year, of the students who graduated last spring, only 19% of them had debt. Wow. Which is pretty impressive. Is, is that a function of the people coming here having the financial power to pay for it? Or is that a function of... It's a function of our people. financial aid program, really? right? Wow. So we don't expect students to borrow mm -hmm. um, as part of their financial aid package. Right. So when we do that analysis and look at what their family can be expected to pay and mm -hmm. what the total costs are, um, we do expect students to work 
to work during the summer and during mm-hmm. the academic year and cover about $5,000 worth of their costs. Mm-hmm. Okay. On the average, for, for most students, that's what the number is. Uh, and then the rest of the costs, we cover their unmet need, we cover with scholarship funds. Okay. So we're not yeah. expecting them to take out that loan. Now, some students obviously do. They are they want to help their parents with their expected parent contribution. Right, right? They've right. got that, that federal loan eligibility, so they might as well take it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So... Now that we've talked about the process, kind of when you are in university, what does, because I'm I'm in the situation where I'm post university where I'm okay, the they're calling me, they're giving me the notifications, the emails, mm-hmm. okay, you have to pay this amount back. Um, if kind of a general question for myself, so how do you fully manage um, the post university dealing with your debt? <laughs> I'm looking at Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I would definitely say if you if you took out loans, um, federal or private loans, keep in contact with your servicer. You know that's the most important person in your life right now is your <laughs> is your servicer <laughs> or your. Well, lender. Who's the servicer? Like? The servicer would be. Uh, I'm just gonna throw some names out there, sure, but sure. you know it would be like a Mojiva or a Great Lakes or so these are uh, financial these are federal, institutions that are federal running? servicers for the government. Oh, okay. okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So what happens is once when you graduate, um, your loan basically gets transferred over to the servicer, so they will collect the the debt for the the government pretty much Mm -hmm. that's what happened and then the private the private services would be like your your sally may you know the person that you took that loan out with your sally may would these generally be the unsubsidized loans that fit in that category or does it actually no 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 so with the federal it would be the sub unsub Uh loans Mm -hmm. that would go to like the the great lakes you know and everything so you're talking about private loans so as far as like the private loans that would be with the sally may okay and the wells fargo so Uh depending Depending on your situation, you know, if you have the federal loans, contact your servicer. Keep in contact with them. Call them whenever you have a question, whenever Mm -hmm. you can't make a payment, whenever you think you can't make a payment. If you're not sure you can make a payment, you know, if you want to lower your payment, if you want to raise your payment, call your servicer. It sounds like what you're describing is that there is flexibility built into the system. very lot. It, it is so much flexibility with the with the services. It is ridiculous. The only problem is people don't call. They they mm-hmm. avoid them. Right. They actually avoid them. You know. Right. And that to me, yeah. That to me, that really speaks to the importance of of relationships, right? Mm-hmm. If you understand that you are beholden to some financial institution, and you try to actually communicate and have a, a relationship and understand. Let them know where you're at and talk to them and don't just hang up the phone when they right. call. Right. There is actually. They're not just some scary <laughs> debt right. collector. Right. I think it right. feels that way for it a does. lot of people. Right. 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 No, no, no. They they have, like, numerous plans for you. They even have suspension plans where you mm-hmm. don't have to make payments. But I So I tried to qualify for something like that, but I, sure. I didn't have an income. Um, and they told me I could only qualify for deferment. Sure. Um, could you kind of describe the difference between that? Sure, sure. So in the event, in the event that you are not able to make any payments, there is what's called a deferment um, where it's – so there's different types of deferments. There's a economic hardship deferment where if you are, you know, below the poverty line, you know, you're not making enough. Um, there is an unemployment deferment where if you are unemployed, um, there's a couple other deferments, but basically you do not have to make a payment on your on your loan. Are they still charging interest at that point? So that that is correct. On your unsubsidized loans, the interest still is accrued, but on your subsidized loans, the interest does not accrue on a deferment. So say you got out of college, mm-hmm. you had a job for a couple months, and then you got fired or had to move or something happened. Mm-hmm. So you apply for a deferment and you get it. Mm-hmm. For a subsidized loan, that would mean that you are back to not accruing interest correct. until you're officially working again. Correct, correct, correct. On that subsidized loan, and then on the unsub, the interest will continue to accrue. Continues, yeah. Right. And then there's the option of a forbearance. Oh. Um, a lot of people call them forbiddance. A lot of <laughs> people call them 
Corbett is. Sounds like it's got a bad rap. (laughs) What is that even? Lay it out for us. So, yes, yes, sure, sure. So, the forbearance is is suspension of your payments as well. Uh The the main difference between the forbearance and the deferment is you are responsible for all of the interest Mm -hmm. on your sub and unsub. So, a lot of times, your services do not like to give a forbearance for a long length of time because they're looking out for you because of the interest that will accrue. So just think, you know, if you were on a forbearance for one year, you know, that's a year of interest, right? you know, whereas if you were on a deferment for a year, you know, that's less interest that you would have to be responsible for. So hmm? how long can you be on a deferment? So on a deferment, the, the, economic hardship deferment i believe it is for a year okay you know i may be each, wrong each one yeah. maybe on but yeah, yeah. each one of the each of them have, have like different different, different times yeah uh-huh. so you, you, like i said you check your service to, yeah, so, yeah contact, contact your, your service right <laughs> to them often, i don't want right. to give you any wrong information but yeah, contact yeah. your service what they're gonna do is look for the best deal they can find right. for you right they have this list of deferments that the yeah. Congress has agreed to allow, right? right? So there's lots of rules involved. They're looking through that list to find the one that best fits your situation that's going to keep you out of trouble. Right. And if all else fails, they always have this forbearance available. Right. right? Okay. Right. So that's the backup plan. Exactly. Right. right. Exactly. And, and then the forbearance, again, it is for whatever amount of time the servicer has a plan for. Okay. So. Okay. Now, I know there's a lot of people getting out of college who are not getting jobs right away or maybe mm-hmm. got a degree that isn't actually very high demand in the, in the job market. Mm-hmm. So is it really often and sort of common that people are applying for these ways of, of, of deferring or taking time before they're making their payments? Is that do we, do we have any concept of that? No, no. So, so well, I actually used to work at a service. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I know, you know, I, I have like firsthand experience. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times uh, people do call and they do say, hey, you know, I just graduated. You know, I can't pay this loan. You know, what can you do for me? Give me, give me a forbearance, you know, and like. You know, Cameron's saying we have to run down. It's an actual list that we have to run down. We have to give them the best option possible. So in that situation, you know, if we're just talking about deferment and forbearances, the deferment would be the best option. The unemployment deferment mm-hmm. would, or economic hardship would be their best option. A uh, forbearance would not be, would not even tell them about a forbearance because mm-hmm. that would not be in their best interest. Right. Now, um, that's basically was my story. They didn't mention anything about deferments, but they were like, well, we have a deferment. There's this deferment. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Everybody gets sort of a built in grace period, is what it's called. How long is that grace period? Usually six months. Six months. Okay. For most of the programs, it's a six month period before those payments start. So during that time, you might start hearing from your servicer. They're Mm -hmm. reaching out to you to set up your online account and make sure they know where to find you. Mm -hmm. And so the communication starts during that time. And if you haven't heard from your servicer during that time, we recommend that you reach out to them, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's back to this. They're trying to help you, so how don't do you, hide from them. How do you find out who your servicer is? Right. Like if we, you haven't gotten contacted sure, yet. Sure. So you can always go on NSLDS, um, National Student Loan Database system or service i think it's system though something like um, that. something like this one else mm-hmm. and sls right um <laughs> google it if you can and, <laughs> and they and they do have your your servicer okay and also they will have the amount that you have borrowed as well so okay so that's NS, sort of a nsls sort of a central location that manages all this similar to fafsa or even connected right that's okay right. Okay. You can so. always reach out to the financial aid office, too, so the staff there okay. can help walk you through how to find these resources. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now I, I don't know. I don't want you to name any names necessarily, but is there, like, a, a really encouraging or, like, powerful story you could share about somebody who was able to do college because of your financial aid services or something that, like, it really made it work for them? Oh, gosh, so many. <laughs> Give us one. We want to warm so people's many. hearts. Yeah. 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 After talking about loans and debt, let's <laughs> warm their hearts. <laughs> we have to well, go. I have plenty of stories we have about to loans. back out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so those, 
undergraduate scholarships that we award really allow students from all walks of life to come mm-hmm. to Stanford. Yeah. So, you know, we've supported students who come from that foster youth background who've mm-hmm. been in uh, some really tough situations, uh, students whose families just really can't, are, you know, barely supporting themselves, can't mm-hmm. support the students at all, uh, who have made it big and gone on to yeah. do all the things that Stanford students do, work for Google and all those good things. Yeah, it's kind of crazy how attending this school can really change the trajectory of someone's life, right? That's right, right, absolutely. Yeah, okay. And what, what's the most heartbreaking thing that you have to, have to deal with in your jobs? With me, it's <laughs> not a person or a student not having enough room. So they they expect one amount, but then they are not nearly close to mm-hmm. that amount. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, where are they going to get the rest of the money from? You know, they call, they're looking for money. So that's like one of the hardest things that I that I actually see being in a being in the office. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and this so this would be a student who got into Stanford and now just doesn't quite have the financial backing to actually attend. Is that kind of? I think more than that, it's it's what Brandon's talking about are students that, you know, maybe came with some credit card debt or Mm. other financial issues before they came to Stanford and are unable to to make those ends meet. The federal student loans that we're talking about are for current educational expenses so we have limits on the amounts that we can give to students sure and especially being in this area it's a very expensive area to just live and survive and pay regular bills like food and transportation and And we do our best to recognize all of those expenses i think where we see students struggling are when they have expenses in addition to sort of the standard expenses. Right. right. Mm. Yeah. It must be heartbreaking to see a student coming in here and then having so many. I think one of, one of the heartbreaking situations I see are students who, um, who decide to leave without completing their degree. Mm. Um, What are some of the circumstances? and, And that may not happen very often at Stanford. Often, um, you know, it's health reasons, mm, uh, mm-hmm. mental health issues are really difficult for some students to deal with. And it's hard if you leave to come back and get yeah. back into the swing of things. So the worst situation, the, the one we all want to avoid, is having student loan debt but not having the degree right, to back right. that debt up. And so right? that's a reality, right? If you if you wash out or have a hard time or some kind of life hardship strikes, which they do, mm-hmm. and then you've taken out these loans, you're still on the hook for those loans regardless of if you got the degree or not. That's right. right. But students can actually take a leave of absence even over many years and come back and yeah, still. Absolutely. Right. The yeah. financial aid still apply. And the financial aid is still there for them. That's mm-hmm. right. So I think that's an important th- thing for people to know is that it's not the end of the road, even if you're having a hard time or you can't necessarily continue college in that moment. Your money can be still waiting for you. Mm-hmm. Even your college opportunity, you don't have to reapply if, once you've gotten in. If you, again, talk to people and communicate and let them know what you're doing and actually ask you can step away and deal with life and come back. And that's right. It, what about if it was an extended absence, say three, four, five years? Could they? Is it still deferred, or is it possible to defer for that long, or would it just be you're on the hook after your first year out if you didn't graduate? Most of the deferments have do have limits built yeah. in. So with a with a deferment, I believe you only have three years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, for for the life of the loan. Yeah. Um, so after those three years, you have to you know look into some other options. Um, Is that a collective three years, or you could do three years there, you, three years somewhere else? Yeah, you could. You could. So so it's like if you did one one year and then make payments, mm-hmm. and then another year make payments, and then another year. That's that's it. So okay. So it could be kind of it stretched could be, out. It could be stretched mm-hmm. out. It could be all together. Just depending on how your servicer, you know, will give you those three years. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a strange question, maybe, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, but how long does it generally take people to get out of debt if they're taking on loans mm. through, throughout their college? Like, if they really come here with no money and no financial support? What is, it, what is the, the amount of time they could expect to be in debt? 
So the standard, <laughs> the assuming they're making their standard, payments and right, job, right. right? No, no, right. The standard amount of time mm-hmm. is ten years. That is that is okay. what you're looking at after is after that college. Stanford that is Stanford specifically. That, no, that's okay. not Stanford specific. Okay. <laughs> so, so besides Stanford, you know, any anywhere else, you know, once you graduate. You're put on what's called a standard plan, and that's yeah. 10 years. Your servicer calculates mm-hmm. 10 years, 10 years worth of payments. After those 10 years, that's that is it. Now, however, you can always pay more, you know, to limit or you know decrease those 10 years. So that's like a car loan, where if no penalty for early payment, that's if you right. pay ahead of time, it that's will right. mean you're paying less interest overall. That's right. Now, also, if you are enrolled in auto debit you will receive an interest rate reduction. And so that will, you know, reduce those 10 years as well. And I believe What is auto debit? So, so, so auto debit is basically when the servicer takes the money out of your account. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's like a 0. 0.25, uh, 0. 0.25 interest rate reduction. We'll um, say approximately. Okay. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. But no, but just, like I said, your servicer will let you know, but I believe it's a 0.25 interest rate reduction. And a lot of times people say, well, that is so small. I'm like, but you got to think of it over, you know. Right. Compounding time. interest actually yeah, builds I, on itself. I'm and, like, yeah. I'm like that 0.25, you didn't have that before. So that's not 10 years. That is a little less than 10 years if you right. were enrolled in auto debit. And that mm-hmm. just simply means it comes out of your account each month. Each sort month. of like a way that they're guaranteeing their money is coming in so they're willing to like cut you a little slack. Mm-hmm. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, interesting. All right. So this is like double a car loan length, right? A car loan's generally five years if you're taking mm-hmm. the full length of it. Mm-hmm. And a third of a house loan. <laughs> there you go. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yes. So how speaking of different loans, how much would you or like what are the main differences um, in how a education loan to compare it to a house loan, car loan, does it, does it, dif- it differentiate? I, I think the, the big difference is all the flexibility that we're talking about. So mm. the deferment options, you know, even forbearance, okay. income-based repayment, for uh-huh. example. Um, the federal student loans right now have something called public service loan forgiveness. If you make your payments on time for 10 years and you've been working for a nonprofit, that whole time. Mm. And so, and you're on an extended repayment plan because you're not making a whole lot of money. They'll forgive whatever's left over at, at the end of that 10 years. Yeah. I think, I think my mom got that. She's a social worker for CPS. And I think oh, okay. that, that basically Could was be. part of it. Yeah. And I, I had like a, a forgivable scholarship loan yeah. which was, I, because I was a teacher. Yes. And I was able to get out of like a $10,000 of debt yeah. because mm-hmm. I worked in a, in a school <laughs> right. district, right. which was Pretty awesome because I didn't want to pay back that money. So I think uh, the, maybe the moral of the story is talk to your servicer. Yeah. Like, do, do apply because there yeah. may very well be a good financial package to get you here. Right, right. No, a, a lot of times, um, same situation, you know, when you said that um, coming straight out of school, you know, I'm not able to get a job. Um, a servicer will put you on one of your income-driven repayment plans. That's like the – that's what's going on right now. They will automatically go to an income driven repayment plan because you have a zero, you, you don't have any income, you have zero income. So, mm-hmm. more than likely, what's going to happen is you will receive a zero monthly installment. So, basically, you don't have to make any, any payments. Yeah. So, you know, with your income driven repayment plans, you do have to qualify or reapply every year, though, you know, right, just right. to say, hey, you know, I'm still not, I'm still not. I still don't have a job or, you know, hey, I have a job, but, you know, I still can't really afford a lot. So do you know if that is notified like through notifications or if email or if that just ends up happening? No, no. So so um, your service for it, your service. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, your service or if you if you call your service and say, hey, you know, I'm not able to make this five hundred dollar payment, you know. What can you do for me? The the first thing they'll go to probably is the income general. They you know they'll mm-hmm. ask you well how much are you making? What's your family size? They run through the list and they'll give you a a payment, you know. And they'll ask you what well, are you able to make this payment? Yes, you know, no. And if not, then they'll just keep going through the list. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of take this in another direction for a minute. <laughs> 
Say you're at a cocktail party and you tell people, I work in financial oh, aid at Stanford. Yeah, yeah, you know, probably, right? What are the reactions? <laughs> yeah, what, what is the, it, say you can't hide it anymore, you're on the spot, everybody's waiting to hear what you do. What do people ask you? What are the comments that you get? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm of a certain age and a lot of my friends have, uh, kids who are looking to go to college. Right. Right. So the question, first question I get is how do I get my kid into Stanford? And how do you answer? Right. And I say, well, I only help students afford it. I can't get them in. Right. Right. So that. (laughs) Well, you're no good to us. We're going to talk to somebody else at this party. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, So we have that conversation first. Uh And then either, either people love us, right? I get a lot of hugs come admin weekend, right? Uh, You know, it's really fabulous. We have some wonderful families out there. Um, Or they're a little uncomfortable with us and frustrated with us. What do you think is the source of that? Well, so we're trying to make Stanford affordable, right? Right. That's a hard word. Affordable means different things to different people. Right, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. So we ha- we have to draw the line somewhere. And, right. and sometimes people disagree with our assessment of their ability to pay. Right. And, you know, to those families, I, I always say, keep telling us about your situation. There's some detail that, you know, if it's really that difficult for you to pay, that right. we don't know about yet. So, you know, share that information with us and we'll see what we can do. Mm-hmm. Are you saying this isn't just a black and white on, ink on paper Absolutely kind of not. thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's such an important point because especially a lot of parents and children from low-income families, they don't necessarily understand how much their own agency comes into play. There's, you know, all this paperwork and it can be very daunting and they can kind of like take a, as many steps as they know how and then just sort of, throw their hands up and say, I don't know what to do, right? I don't, I don't have the next step. And I think something that keeps coming up here is this importance of just reaching out, just talking to someone, creating a relationship, right. call every day and be nice, right? right. It's not like you're sitting, it's not like you're sitting behind the desk going like, whose life am I going to ruin today, right? Yeah. You're, you're doing a public service. That you're helping not people. What motivates <laughs> people right, in the funny right, place. right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you want more of these hugs at the admit yeah. day. That's like the heartwarming <laughs> part the that keeps you going to work, right? That's right. So, yeah, and I think this is just a very important part, especially for people who are not coming with a lot of agency or, or background or understanding or parents that went to college is talk, talk, ask, be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, be the nice and respectful squeaky wheel that calls every day and is warm and welcoming but persistent, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so I'm going to become best friends. <laughs> <laughs> i got to get those loans figured out. I have a feeling that my co-host has, like, her own agenda with this. <laughs> I love it, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have been uh, scheming all along. It's like I had no clue how to deal with this. So, honestly, that's why I called you guys. <laughs> yeah, I know I'll be here now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that honestly cleared up a lot of confusion and hopefully as well for our listeners. is um, a great way to be able to kind of. Brandon, you haven't it. given us yes. a cocktail story. Cocktail story. Yeah. Yeah. So, what with, happened? With how did it go? Every, every time, same situation. So what do you do, you know, I'm a loan coordinator? Oh yeah, well I have these loans that I need to get rid of. <laughs> Every can you help time. me? Right? Can you help me out? You know, what do I need to do? Uh huh. And, and do you have a call your servicer? <laughs> That's the That's advice, my go-to. Right? That is my okay. go-to. Now, call what if what if you like them better than just call your servicer? No, what no. If you? I if I like them, uh-huh. you know, if they family, you know, I okay. you know go more in depth. Like, come on, so what would you do? Man, Say it's call. like your your nephew asking. Yeah, you yeah. So if it was it feels like them? nephew. No, no. So st- I have a story. So mm-hmm. my auntie, my auntie, um, she took out a um, loan for her, her daughter, mm-hmm. um, a parent plus loan, you know, where the parent can take out a loan for their child. Um, so Is that like a co-signer basically or a little different? Uh, it's actually no. in the parent's name. Yeah. Okay. The, the loan is actually the, the parents, but the money, you know, goes towards the students or the child's education. And is that protected? So, so the parent couldn't necessarily take the loan out and, and take the money and not put it towards school? Is there safeguards? In they do send the money to us first. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. Go. Most parents are very, you know, want to help their kids. That's not, right. not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> So, so auntie took out took out the loan for for uh, my my cousin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 
Panther, you know, the money went toward the school. My cousin got the degree, you know, whatever, whatever. So my auntie is stuck paying the, the loan back. Um, she got hurt on her job. Mm-hmm. Right. So to, to where that she could not make any more payments. She could no longer work. Um, but, and, you know, she still had like little savings saved up. But she was, you know, depleting her savings trying sure. to pay this loan. So she came to me because I was actually in the servicing. I was servicing when she, when okay. she came to me. Yeah. And so she was like, Brandon, you know, I, I can't I can't deal with this loan. What do I need to do? And so I was like, you know, call your servicer. <laughs> <laughs> I call knew that servicer. was coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, no. <laughs> so I was like, so I said, I said, Auntie, I know I know your situation. I know you're not working at this time. So I said, when you call your servicer, you know, ask for what's called a total and permanent disability. That's where, you know, if you're not working, right. if you're no longer able to work, the loan will basically be discharged or, or forgiven from, you know, not being able to work. So... Well, see, I can said, see a lot of people hurting themselves. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just get out of there, Lauren. Please, please don't. Please please don't. Yeah, Call your service don't. Not, <laughs> not encouraging that. <laughs> but, but my auntie, she called a servicer. You know, she she got the uh, total permanent disability. She said that they um, asked for some information. They asked for, like, the disability, uh, the documentation and everything. So mm-hmm. um, she said, I believe six six to eight months, six to eight months later, yeah. you know, the, the loan was, was gone. So. Wow. Wow. That's so awesome that there is mm-hmm. one that you were able to help her because mm-hmm. we always want to take care of our family if we can. Right. But two, that there is, awesome. I think that that story really highlights the, the flexibility and right. how important right. it is to seek out the help you need, get the right advice, make those connections and mm-hmm. calls and keep on it until something happens. And, and again, the government has like plenty of options that, if there's an option for every situation, you know. Mm-hmm. At first, I didn't, I didn't realize it until I actually worked at the at the servicing. Right. I was, I was in the same situation. I was like, oh, I can't pay this loan. I don't know what to do. Yeah. I'm broke. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, when I started working at the servicer, you know, yeah. you get educated. You educate yourself. You know, they say, well, hey. These are the options. And you look at me like, wow, I didn't know this. Wow. So you options. were scheming yourself. You I went in there myself. to try to figure out the answers. <laughs> right. I was coming. trying to figure everything <laughs> out myself, yes. So, yeah, yes. yeah. Well, that's a good route. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's so awesome just to get this kind of behind-the-scenes uh-huh. look. Because yes. I think it is a, sort of a daunting, monolithic mm-hmm. idea of financial aid and the facts, right. uh, and it can right. feel very intimidating. Right. And I think uh, we got some really great information today. The fast is online, and it is streamlined to be much easier than it ever was. So even if it was a scary experience before, check it out again. That's right. Uh, let's see. Let's recap. What else do we got here? We what was that website that you referred us to for your servicer? NSLDS. NSLDS. Okay, excellent. And or just call the financial aid office if you can't figure that out. Right. 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 Um, there are ways to get out of your loans or to defer them or put them off to either not have interest or at least not have or to or lower your repayment plan. Mm-hmm. If okay. you if you still want to make payments just a, at a lower rate, you can call them to have your if you have your payment lowered. Okay, okay. and then if you're out of college. Call your servicer right away. Call your servicer. Talk right to them away. every know day. Know who they are. Right. Make a buddy in the service department. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Send them flowers. Be nice to them. <laughs> They'll be they, knowing they them take, for the next Can they take time bribes? Time. Is that a thing? They cannot take bribes. <laughs> okay. Don't don't bribe them then. But everything else but besides that. Everything else. <laughs> send them send them cards, flowers, candy. Right. They right. still right. enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And give your financial aid people a hug when you get in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Say thank you. Be nice. Show right. up. Yeah. Get your degree too. I mean, that's what this yes, is all about, that's right? What that's get what your we're degree, here for. contribute sure to society, that right? That's why we're doing this, right? That's right. Yes. And I think that is about all the time we have. It goes by so fast. It does. It is. Thank you. An hour is gone. I feel like we could chat about this financial aid for another two hours. It's been our Thank pleasure. You guys. <laughs> so we have we have Karen and Brandon here. They are from the Stanford Financial Aid Office. They have come in to chat with us today here on Modern Education. We're here every Friday. From 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute, and we're having a good time trying to share some educational knowledge and some guests and trying to get you hooked up with your financial aid info so that you can get things going. This is Ben Woodford for Modern Education, and we are signing off.